Thanks. Okay. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Scott Mitchell, and I'm a, a member of the Canadian Knowledge Transfer and Exchange Media Practice Coordinating Committee. Uh, fellow Coordinating Committee member, Jane Herman Gibson, here with us. Um, just out of curiosity, how many folks have actually signed up to join the Community of Practice online? Show of hands. Okay, good. So um, the, uh, the community actually has a little over a thousand members now, um, mostly in Ontario, but also BC and uh, internationally as well. So we've got a chapter in BC, a chapter in Ottawa, and uh, continuing to grow, so a lot of interest. So thanks for coming out uh, to this event. I just want to say a couple of words uh, before we get started, then I'll introduce the, the speakers for today. So just you're in the right place if you came to see Connecting the Dots through the Ontario Neuroscience Asset Map. We're good? Okay. Great. All right. Um, so um, we actually have uh, we have one more event uh, in planning for this season coming up at the end of June. Give you a heads up. Uh, we have a visiting lecturer from the UK, Christina uh, Miariti. She's the Research Impact Officer at the University of Sussex in Brown. So uh, she's um, coming, doing some visits, site visits at York and so on, but she'll be presenting. We haven't set a location yet. If you want to find out, so when, go and sign up, uh, become a member if you're not already at uh, kplp.ca. It's free. So um, I encourage you to do that. Um, and we'll also be sending out uh, a feedback survey after today's event just to get a bit of feedback from you about uh, what you learned today and the connections you may have made. So, um, so without further ado, I will introduce our speakers. Uh, so thanks to, to Kirk and Lucas and Shiva for organizing today's event. They really did all the work. And, and if you want to grab a coffee and a donut or something often before we get started, please do. Sorry. Thanks. You're welcome. welcome. Good timing. Um, just a, a quick uh, housekeeping note for those of you here. Washrooms are outside the, and down, women straight down the hall. Men's is to the left and around the corner. But you need a hall pass to get back in. So uh, there's a, Kirk has a, a pass here he will share if you need to. I'm not sure. Maybe we should put it. I've got one. And, uh, okay. Yeah. So if anyone needs to, to leave, please feel free. Okay. So Kirk um, Kirk is the director of outreach here at the Ontario Brain Institute, and uh, so he's in charge of communications and knowledge exchange. And uh, he actually has a number of other knowledge exchange roles. So so with the uh, Epilepsy Ontario, okay, so chairing their provincial knowledge translation working group and uh, is a member of the Ontario SPORE support unit uh, working on knowledge translation. For those of you who don't know, SPORE is CIHR's strategy for patient-oriented research. Is that correct? Right. And the support group, um, they provide, uh, well, you can talk a bit about it if you like. Maybe we can do another session on SPORE because we yeah. haven't really had anyone talk at KT about SPORE, so that would be really interesting. Um, Lucas, uh, Ing is uh, OBI's uh, program officer in the industry relations. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And Lucas uh, led this initiative that we're going to um, be looking at today. Yeah. You'll take credit. I, I don't want to take all the Lucas. Okay. Is okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also joining us is Shiva Amiri, who is the uh, manager of informatics and analytics at OBI. Um, and her project is Brain Code. So a large-scale bioinformatics platform that stores and manages multiple uh, data types from cutting-edge neuroscience projects across the planet. So I'm assuming these are interrelated. So anyway, uh, I'll let you talk a bit more about your roles if you like, but uh, please go ahead. Um, well, thank you everyone for coming today. It's really great to have you here. Lucas and I were joking this morning that uh, we're ready to be two people come the, the topic of neuroscience and then uh, an asset map. Uh, so we're really happy to have you here. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background of around what we do at OBI, just to give you the context and give you a sense of where the asset mapping work fits in. So this is what we call our innovation system, and it's basically just a map of what we do as an organization. So you'll see at the center our goal is to actually improve brain health, which may seem weird as a research uh, funding organization, but what I hope to convince you of is, in fact, we're a lot more than a research funding organization. We're in the role of, uh, of change management with the research enterprise. What we do, uh, we often joke that we don't actually do anything in house here other than build relationships, catalyze, uh, get people to work together, collaborate in different ways. So the purple band sort of describes what it is we do. 
at the core of, of, um, of our activity are these research programs that we fund, and there's five of them right now. So I'll go through them and what they look like in a, in a moment, but um, just to say they have certain required elements of what they must look like. They have to be Pan-Ontario, so one lab in Toronto doesn't cut it. It needs to be people from across the province working together on a common disorder. They need to involve patients, they need to involve patient advocates, they need to involve clinicians, researchers, and companies. And those are, it's like figure skating, those are the required elements. And uh, you can't be an OBI research program without them. What we then do is we work with these groups to do things in a common way. So whether they're in Thunder Bay or Toronto or Windsor, the idea is that they're doing common assessments. So if they're clinicians, they're doing the same depression inventories. Um, they're doing imaging in the same way. They're taking uh, genetic samples in the same way. And what that allows us to do is actually compare data from across the province, which is a big issue in science because everyone has their own way of, of doing things, which means we can't compare the results necessarily. So we're trying to get people at a core anyway to do things in a common way, which really necessitates uh, brain code, which is this informatics platform that Shiva um, is managing. And all these data come in, and now across disorders, we can actually begin to compare as well as within disorders, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, we have a commercialization mandate, so we're funded by the province of Ontario through the Ministry of Research and Innovation. So the idea is we need to um, help um, researchers develop companies where they have intellectual property and where they want to. And we also have um, larger companies advise our researchers on how they might do things differently to create something uh, beyond a publication. And then the training program um, is something that we evolved. It wasn't initially in part of our mandate, mind you, neither was brain code. Um, and it started with a lot of us griping about our friends who can't find work, who have PhDs in neuroscience. And uh, our CEO uh, sort of challenged us to do something about it. And so we developed a three-pronged program um, which allows people with a PhD in neuroscience to get experience away from the bench. So we have an entrepreneur's program. If you want to start a company, we'll fund you to do that. It's a competitive process. It's kind of like Dragon's Den, um, and if successful, we'll fund you for a year, but more importantly, we, train, we give you training, and the focus is on the individual, not the company. So the idea is if your company fails, you'll just start another company. We're trying to create serial entrepreneurs. Um, <laughs> we have, <laughs> um, which is good. You may have to treat them. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, we have a, an internship program, which allows people to get hands-on experience. So. They'll spend some time, six months at OBI here, and they'll have a specific project that they work on. And we have a management fellowship program, which again is a, is a competitive program. Um, and people spend six months here at OBI on a specific project that's linked to a six-month placement that they do with an organization. So the management fellow on my team, for example, is working on physical activity and Alzheimer's disease, and she's then going to go work for the Alzheimer's Society for six months. Um, the big purple circle is sort of a, to give the point that we can't do this on our own. Partnerships are key to everything that we do. There's not a single thing we do that isn't in partnership with someone else. And outreach is sort of a key to taking everything that's going on inside this innovation system and getting it out to the real world. So whether it's policy or, or health guidelines or pu public awareness, um, and that's the role of, of the outreach group here. So I'm just going to talk a little bit more about outreach because that's um, sort of the focus of today's discussion, and I think the most appropriate thing we do for this, for the KTECOP. Um, basically, what we try and do is serve as a bridge between what's happening inside the circle and, and, and the broader community. We have four goals. One is storytelling, and this is really around raising awareness of brain disorders. We often say that in cancer, we have one word that conjures fear, and it's this is totality of whether it's easy to treat or, or the most lethal, it's all in the same word and it has this, this gravitas to it. But in brain, we don't have the same thing. We have mental health and we have neurological and we have some things where it's unclear where they fit. And we don't really have a language around um, giving a sense of impact on the totality of brain disorders. Um, so we're, that's one of the key stories we're trying to tell is that there's a lot of them and, um, and they're really important for us to be focusing on. Building community, um, so this is where we try and bring different groups together. One of the examples I'll talk about is bringing patients and their advocates together with the research community. Aligning evidence and care, and, and Scott referred to a few of the things that we're doing in this area. I'll elaborate a bit more. And then evaluating impact. So these are the four components of outreach. So storytelling, this just gives you a sense of some of the things that we do. Um, we uh, Obviously, we have a website where we are increasingly active in social media and looking for tips and advice from people on how we can be more active. 
We do webinars regularly to our, our stakeholders. We have newsletters. We try and do plain language or clear language summaries of what the research programs are doing. We participate in Brain Awareness Week, and we're always looking for people to join us. Um, this year we did, um, I guess it's not here. This year we did a campaign on iHeartBrain, which is really trying to, to steal the, the, um, all, the, all the knowledge and awareness around cardiac and, and transfer to brain. The idea of, of uh, so the, the, the heart actually looks like a brain. Maybe just to give you a sense of um, what our research programs look like and, and one of the ways we try and tell the story is I'll just show you a quick video. Uh, for those on the line, I hope you can hear this. Um, it should come through the speakers. I'm just going to pull this up. Sorry to those on the line um, for not being able to hear that. The videos are on our YouTube channel. Um, we're getting a lot of feedback if we turn the speakers on, so again, sorry about that. So this just gives you a sense of the, of the breadth of what we're trying to achieve. So you have the researchers, the clinicians, companies, the uh, patients and advocates all playing a part. And we've started using we call them commercials for our research programs, little teasers to try and get people to be aware of what it is that we're doing. So our second goal is around creating community and, and these are the things that we do um, in that. So we do talk and listen tours, we call them. We go around the province and being based in Toronto and with a lot of the research activity happening in Toronto, we have to fight um, the appearance of being Toronto-centric. Um, and so we, we put a lot of energy into traveling the rest of the province to the neuroscience programs and learning about what people are doing there. So we usually go on mass and we'll have a day where we talk all about what we do and then we take tours of all the labs and all the research institutions. And then the second day we break off, so I'll go meet, you know, um, the local chapter of the Alzheimer's Society or I'll go meet Patients Canada or whatever and, and go meet with different groups and then my commercialization colleagues will go meet with companies and incubators in the area and Don will go meet with the VPs of research and the CEOs of the hospitals and the idea is just to get a sense of what's going on and figure out how we can fit the activity that's going on into the programs that we're already working with. And it gives us a sense of capacity too, right? We learn maybe there's a, so when we went to Thunder Bay we learned about their imaging program that we really didn't have any idea about. Um, and they're developing their own cyclotrons to so be able to make um, um, tracers for, for pet detectors. And, and this is huge for us to know because there's a lot of studies that need that capacity and then we can bring them into the fold and then when it's ready. So these are what our patient advisory committees look like. So POND is our program around neural developmental disorders. This is autism, ADHD, intellectual disability, and obsessive compulsive disorder. And these researchers thought that they should be looking at commonalities between these disorders as opposed to studying them separately because there's a lot of overlap. And for those of you involved in, in, in 
studying or working in the, in the field of brain disorders, there's no such thing as a pure, distinct brain disorder that exists in isolation and, and the individual has nothing else. There's always, you always see comorbidities, you always see things because the brain is, of course, an organ of behavior and it's really complex. So epilepsy, or Epilink is our epilepsy program. CanBind is our depression program. Uh, Andre is our neurodevelopmental, neurodegenerative disorders program. And that one's unique too. It has individuals looking at ALS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease, frontal temporal lobar dementia, and vascular cognitive impairment. And again, looking at commonalities as opposed to why they're different. So in this program, they have everyone going through gait assessments. Normally that's something that only individuals with Parkinson's disease would get, but they believe that there's motor components to all these different neurodegenerative disorders. And then CPNET, that's the one you saw the video for, that's our cerebral palsy program. So what we do is we bring these um, advocacy groups, and in all cases we have individuals living with these disorders sitting around a table. We meet quarterly. The researchers provide a clear language summary of what's happened in the last quarter. Um, and these groups can then take it and put it in a newsletter and put it online. So the, the goal here is to position them as the knowledge brokers of research in the province. They've already got the audience. They already have the communications materials. How do we make them the experts? Um, and then they're starting to help our research programs through recruiting patients for trials, for example. So they have that connection with individuals and they can actually start um, asking people if they want to uh, participate. Any questions at all? Yeah, sure. Uh, do you find that uh, the advocacy groups or the patients are also helping the researchers to decide what to look at next? Sorry. So are, they, are they also helping the researchers to, to what is the next research question they yeah. should be asking? Yeah. How should they alter their research questions? So it is a general rule that hasn't been happening yet, but that's something we do want to get towards. We have a couple of examples of that happening. So for example, Mary Secco in the epilepsy program, she runs the Epilepsy Support Center in London, and they have this, um, this program called uh, Clinic to Community, or yeah, Clinic to Community, and she wanted to pilot it, and one of the researchers in the program thought it was a fabulous idea and is now evaluating it, so it's now folded into the research activity. Um, but I think that's probably been an exception to date, but that's definitely where we're going with this. We really want um, I heard a talk with by Andreas Lapakis a few weeks ago talking about what they've done in, in, in stage renal disease and it's phenomenal how they're engaging patients and prioritizing research questions. And to have after two days of activity the number one research question come out as itching I think blew all the researchers' minds. I mean nobody knew that that was the key issue, right? So it's interesting what you'll discover when you actually um, you ask the questions. And I have a question. And so if you want to create another community, maybe something like a network for kids with disruptive behavior problems mm -hmm. and the issue of neuroscience in that regard, so that we would form a network. We would bring the network partner, partners together and then connect with you. Is that how that works? Or yeah, that would be okay. ideal. Okay. Yeah. And our, um, our pond program actually had a family day about a month ago now, and they had 500 families there, 500 people there at McLeod Auditorium, they packed it. And it was just a day of talking about research updates. The families were there. They had sort of a dance pack during the intermission to get the kids up dancing. And they actually brought in a, a string quartet because a lot of kids with autism don't get to go to the, uh, the symphony orchestra. So they got to walk around these musicians and see what they're doing. So it's, it's pretty neat. Like they're doing some really, really neat stuff. And, and these aren't our great ideas. We're just, you know, basically helping make this happen, facilitate and, and help fund it. So goal three is aligning evidence and care. I already mentioned that we're trying to get our researchers to standardize their approaches across the province. So for example, we're doing, I believe we're doing depression inventories in all of our programs, regardless of whether it's depression or not. So neurodegeneration, epilepsy, cerebral palsy, they're all getting um, and that gives us a really neat snapshot so that we can study depression within depression, but we can study depression across other disorders now too. Um, we've done a lot of work in physical activity and Alzheimer's disease. This is sort of the first thing our, our KT program did, just to see if we could actually um, convert on creating knowledge and actually implementing it. And then uh, uh, Scott mentioned I'm a member of the Epilepsy uh, Task Force, and this is a, a provincially funded group creating guidelines around the treatment and diagnosis and treatment of epilepsy in the province. And I'm leading the KT group trying to figure out how to get these messages out to primary care, community neurologists, and the public. So this is just the physical activity example. Um, we, did, we commissioned a meta-analysis uh, with two researchers at York University looking at some 800 articles in physical activity and the prevention and management of Alzheimer's disease. 
And the results were, were highly significant. In fact, the Cochrane review came out a year later and, and showed similar findings that if you're physically active, you can reduce your risk of developing Alzheimer's by 40%. And if you already have Alzheimer's disease and you're physically active, you're, um, likely to have, you're more likely to have higher quality of life, to have more independent, um, and significantly less rates of depression. So this is something that we brought a group of experts in from across the province and actually had a few folks from, from the West in this room. And we went through the AGREE protocol and, and developed consensus statements around um, what we can save for physical activity in Alzheimer's. And we created this toolkit on the left. And this really just outlines what we can confidently say about physical activity in Alzheimer's, what it looks like. And um, the idea is we're distributing now um, the SUBI Alzheimer's chapters. And we're also sponsoring um, the Minds in Motion pilot program. And this is a program being run in six different sites across the province for two years. And it gets individuals and their caregivers with um, individuals with Alzheimer's and their caregivers that once a week for physical activity. And this creates an opportunity for us to hand out the toolkit and, and tell people a bit more about what physical activity looks like and how to embed it in their lives. Lastly, um, evaluating impact. Um, so we have an international advisory committee we established. We're, none of us here is necessarily experts in, 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 uh, in evaluation. So the first thing we do is find the experts and, and, and partner with them. We had a workshop here in Toronto and we brought our international advisory committee as well as several evaluation experts from across the province together with companies and patient groups uh, and researchers to talk about what it is we're doing and how we might go about assessing the impact of it. Um, and we, we've now been sort of rolling that out and building up that framework. One of the issues that came up is when you're an organization like ours is there's a control versus influence. We don't directly control anything other than some funding arrangements with, uh, with hospitals, right? The research that gets done, the impact that they have is all influenced but not controlled by us. Um, so you have this conundrum of what it is that you can actually lay claim to. Um, and one of the, Martin Buxton, who's on our, um, on our evaluation committee and he wrote the payback model said, how do you measure the role of a catalyst? This is a really difficult thing to do in the evaluation role because everything's a couple degrees separated from the activity that you're doing. And so one of the ideas that came out of that is, well, what do we do as catalysts is we bring people together and we get them to work together. And so we have this asset map which actually lists everyone in the province that's participating in neuroscience and that kind of served as the, is now going to serve as the framework for us actually measuring how they're working together and how those networks are changing. So I'm turning it over now to Shiva. Yes. Yeah. Yes, thanks, Dirk. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Shiva, and um, I work on uh, Brain Code now, but I was hired as part of the uh, industry relations group, and I was working on a group of neurotechnology projects. I actually started around the same time as Stephanie. And when we started, um, OBI was working with Mars's uh, market research group. Uh, to develop, to try and understand the neuroscience sort of cluster, and I'll explain what a cluster is, um, in Ontario. Uh, we realized that there is a lot going on in Ontario. We just weren't sure exactly what when it came to neuroscience. We actually, um, at the same time, just prior to this, we had done a report with the Boston Consulting Group that indicated that there is a lot of neuroscience in Ontario. There's a lot of researchers. There's a lot of key components of a cluster. There's a few things missing, but Ontario's in pretty good shape. But it's not really, it hasn't come together, and the outcomes aren't really where they're supposed to be. Um, so this is how we think about what a cluster is. It's really a concentration of companies, resources, people, um, in a related industry within sort of a commutable distance. Um, then the, some of the other qualities of a, of a cluster is that companies um, and others in the clusters, it, the formation of the cluster allows for the maximization um, of efficiencies because you can share resources, um, there's employees and skills that could be matched, and there's easier transfer of knowledge. Um, so usually in clusters, there is economic development uh, because of the ability to share resources, people um, all within close proximity. Some examples of clusters are Boston, for example. Boston has a really good life science cluster. There's San Diego. Um, there's North Carolina. So there are areas where um, 
are understood to have really successful clusters, and they usually result in um, scientific outcomes, um, commercialization outcomes, and so on. So we, we wanted to understand what does Ontario's neuroscience cluster look like, and Mars, as market research, had started to do some analysis for us, and then it got to a point where, you know, it was, it, we really had to take it on ourselves. So we took it in-house, and, and Stephanie and I worked on this with a group, and we got, some, we, we got a couple of dedicated people on this to really focus in and try to understand what does this cluster look like, who are the researchers, who are the companies, uh, who are the institutions that are in Ontario that make up this neuroscience cluster. A lot of what we do at OBI is centered around developing a neuroscience cluster. Um, like Kirk was talking about, this is really, we play a, a catalyst role. We bring these groups together. So not only do our research programs have all of these hospitals that you see around the circle involved, so the five programs um, that Kirk mentioned, um, epilepsy, cerebral palsy, pond, neurodegeneration, and depression, there's um, multiple institutes involved in, um, in each one, and some of the institutes are involved in more than one program. In addition to our integrated discovery program, there's the FedDev Ontario program, which is what I was hired to do initially, and this is a um, program which brings together companies with universities or hospitals to develop products, develop neurotechnology products. So that's another example of us working to build and develop this neuroscience cluster. Um, the Experiential Education Initiative, um, also, Kirk also went over this, and this is the program that works with entrepreneurs, interns, to really develop not only the management capacity, uh, give neuroscientists an opportunity to do something else, not necessarily work at the bench, um, but also develop those management skills, entrepreneurial skills to also um, help define a neuroscience cluster, which is one of the things that the Boston Consulting Group report identified as lacking in Ontario was management talent. And then we have a neuroscience early research and development program that again works with companies to help them um, advance in stages where they normally get stuck. So help them work with um, service uh, development groups and product development groups to really push their products uh, to the next level. So this is the neuroscience asset map. We've worked uh, to develop this. It's taken some time. Uh, there was a lot of thinking around how would we, what would this look like, how would we classify this. Um, we, we had a team to do this, and Lucas has done a lot of work on this as well. Um, and at this stage, it's, we've got around 800, over 800 researchers, neuroscience researchers in Ontario. There's over 130 companies, brain-related companies in Ontario. There's over 100 institutions. And we have um, sort of worked with a company called SynMap to create this asset map. And we've thought about a few ways of classifying the information and visualizing the information so that you, researchers and others can use this resource um, to the way that suits them. Um, and this is why um, this is an opportunity for us to talk to this group, to you guys, uh, to learn about how would you use a resource like this and how is it useful to you and get your feedback on what we've been doing. So this is what it looks like. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's a variety of ways of visualizing the information. And it really is a dynamic tool that allows patients, researchers, companies, other institutions to learn about what is going on in neuroscience in Ontario and how can they work together, how can they learn from each other, um, and really sort of think about this, um, these capabilities as, as a cluster. So I'm going to pass it to um, Lucas now to take you through how to use this and what sure. it looks like. Yeah, just to add a bit onto what Shiva mentioned, I think she's completely understating the amount of work it took from you. I mean, initially it was really just an Excel list, um, oh. a bunch of names, and there was no categorization. There's no way to create some sort of compartmentalization of these different types of researchers in Ontario that would add some sort of value under their name. There would be, it was, there was no, no one out there who did that and it was just an Excel sheet as I mentioned and Stephanie and Shiva went through a lot of work to figure out different ways on you know, how can we, how can we organize this list 
this whole jumble of names into a way that would be useful to anybody using it. And as Kirk and Shiva mentioned, you can sort of start to see a trend now. OBI is about collaborating people. It's about bringing people together, and it's about encouraging and promoting the growth of this neuroscience cluster. And how that ties in together is through this ASM map that we're developing, which we hope to achieve by sort of evaluating and seeing you know, how has this, how has the neuroscience landscape in Ontario grown? How has it changed? And where is it move? In what direction is it moving forward on? Um, so that, that was just a bit of add-on to Shiva, but <laughs> on to the, uh, the actual ASM map. I, I just want to give you a quick overview in terms of how it's, how it's used. I'm not sure if anyone's actually had a chance to try it. Um, I think it's it's pretty um, it's pretty intuitive in terms of how to use it. But the advantages of using the ASM map is that it gives you access to a lot of the neuroscience activity that goes on in the province of Ontario. Um, essentially, you can find the researcher, and it would give you a very general overview of their profile such as what are some of their research interests are or what types of technologies or neurological conditions that they're interested in. And it also has a link to their contact information or website information. So you can uh, get in touch with them in that way. In addition, we also use the ASM map as a communication tool. So there are times where OPI has special events or news. And what larger database do we have than this ASM map full of 800 researchers and hundreds of companies and institutions to communicate some of the neuroscience activities, which is, in our way, another avenue of bridging together people, bringing people together to different events that we're hosting, or just keeping them informed about what's going on in terms of the neuroscience activities. So in this, I'm just going to switch over and go over to the actual website. So as Shiva mentioned uh, on the front page, there's the, there are three different maps you'll see. The cluster map, the square map, and the circular map. These are all essentially different ways of visualizing the same type of data. So in the cluster map, you can see that it's the geographical perspective of the clusters of companies, researchers, or institutions in the province of Ontario. And if you were to zoom further in and click on an individual peg, you'd see where the company is located, and you could view their profile directly. And it would give you access to some of the information, such as their website or what sort of activities that they do. And what I find interesting when we did this was there were a lot of different uses for this sort of function. I mean, from my, from my perspective, when we first started this initiative, it would, we thought it would be useful for maybe a company finding another company, a researcher finding another company or researcher to collaborate with. But what was interesting for me was a lot of students actually found this tool very useful as well as they started nearing their graduation days and you know, they're starting to get a bit worried in terms of what to do after. But the ASMAP was uh, it was actually serendipitous in terms of its usage because they would look up certain companies in either a certain location or in a neurological condition that they'd be interested in. And they could just easily just call up either these researchers, institutions, or companies to try and get in touch with them and perhaps find a, a career path in that manner. So are, can I ask, yeah. what kind of data are you collecting on the website you? Because that could be very useful for you in, in analyzing uh, whether you're meeting your goals and you envisioned it to be. So that's, that's a very interesting uh, comment as well. It's, as Kurt mentioned, it's, it's very difficult to sort of evaluate and capture this data. If someone uses it and they end up finding someone, to, like they made a really great connection, there's no way of us really knowing that unless they tell us. <laughs> uh, you know, but I, I, in my opinion, I strongly believe that if this tool is helping someone bridge some sort of connection that they're looking for, that makes me happy. 
if we knew about it, that would make me even more happy. So you <laughs> don't, the software doesn't allow you to send out an email. You don't collect the person's email and send out an email and say, can you, uh, yeah, as we develop the tool, we want to make it better. Can you tell us uh, sure. why you used it? Definitely. Did you make a link or did you make a connection with somebody yeah, in that's, the future? That's definitely a great idea. We should definitely incorporate it. I'm just running Google Analytics in the background okay. so we can see who's using it, how often they're using it, but we can't tell what, what they then go on to do. So uh, the other two maps are the square map and the circular map. They're essentially they're essentially the same. They're just different visualizations. It depends on the preference of the user. But more commonly, people click on the circular map because it's a bigger picture. So essentially, uh, in the in the circular map, you can see you, the, the top level breakdown, which is the location, of companies, institutions, or researchers. So any sort of neuroscience related company, researcher, institution will be or should be located in this map. And there are different ways you can break down this information. And what I started to realize as I started working on this is that people that use this map aren't looking for, they're not looking for a specific company in mind. They're not trying to find a really specific person. They use this tool as a way to help them find a way, help them find a way something that they're interested in and that in turn will lead them to a list of either researchers or companies that could be beneficial to them. So for instance, if you were to go under researcher, you've noticed that there's a further breakdown either by their te technology, their affiliation with either researcher, with, sorry, with either research institution or hospital or academic institution or if you're interested in a specific neurological focus such as a function or a condition or their methods and techniques. So for instance, if you go under affiliation, we can go to Baycrest. And under Baycrest, you'll see the list of neuroscience-related researchers that we have here. And clicking on any profile will give you a further breakdown of what they, a bit of what they do and um, some contact information. And keep in mind, um, when Shiva and Stephanie first started on this, there was literally no information on these people. All these, all these detailed information about each researcher had to be, had to, they had to go online and research them and input all that data individually into these Excel sheets that had to be later exported or imported into this neuroscience asset map, which I think is definitely quite a feat. Um, if you look, sorry, go ahead. Um, so how do you define who's a, a neuroscience researcher? Is it somebody specifically focused on neuroscience research or based on your presentation, it sounds like anybody who's doing research on a, a neural, neurological or neuroscience related disorder? Is it, so that could be a social researcher or how do you define it? Yeah, we, we thought a lot about that question. How do you define a neuroscience researcher? Um, you know, there's a lot of mathematicians that do neuroscience. There's physicists that do neuroscience, engineers, and so on. Um, I think we ended up on if there is a neuroscience problem they're addressing directly, um, then we included them. If they were classified in their institutions under uh, neuroscience or any, you know, a related field, uh, mental health, then we included them. And we also sent the information to their VCs of research and said, did we miss anyone that you would define as a neuroscience researcher? So then we got feedback that way as well from their institution. And we also sent it to the individual researchers, the companies, and asked them, is this information correct? You can update it. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think um, we use a very broad definition of neuroscience. I. If anything, I would rather include than exclude. But in my opinion, that's, that's, how, that's how I feel would add more value to that. Yes, that. Did you also include the organizations who are participating in neuroscience research? In, for example, within study. So, for example, if uh, sick kids was doing a neuroscience study on SNAP kids, at a child development student, there was a study on that. Few studies was was that included or not? Or are you just at this point are just keeping it to the researchers? No, we have a list of institutions. There's over 100 institutions that are involved in uh, neuroscience in Ontario. So if you just go down the institution links, then you will get a list there as well. 
And we also have patient advocacy group lists here as well. So the, the groups that are patient advocacy, um, those groups in Ontario are also included. There's tons of them as well. So Lucas, maybe can you show the, the institutions of patient advocacy? So that's the advocacy group list. So that actually brings me to my next point, is that it's, it's still a rather new list. It's growing, and its progress is highly dependent on the interactivity it has with other users that feel should either add themselves or organization that they know about to be part of this asset. Um, there are a lot of moments where I would present this at another conference and some big shot neuroscience researcher tells me to look him up and he's not there. <laughs> I, you know, I, I always tell him, you know, it's your job to tell me, but, um, you know, little things happen. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's very difficult to capture um, where we are in terms of, you know, ha making sure that we have every individual person that uh, that, that would be relevant, and we definitely don't want to exclude anybody. For it's sure. a dynamic environment. So much is yeah. changing. Yeah. 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 So and researchers get new grants, and so they change their focus because they right. have universities or. Mm -hmm. I think the whole purpose thought. of this is the knowledge is bringing that knowledge forth mm -hmm. that there is this, and mm -hmm. that it's, it's dynamic. It's going to be mm -hmm. forever changing. You can to it, right? Yeah. And people, I assume, can go in and update their stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. So and every six months, we have a validation process that goes in. And and does a check and see is this information still relevant? It will send out an email and says it is still okay. So yeah. So the researchers don't exactly update it themselves per se, but they send in the request for us to change their profile in that way. Because we don't have individual logins for every researcher okay. institution. Because there are times where maybe someone working for an institution might input their institution uh, onto the asset map, but would that mean that they'd be responsible for the entire institution's profile? Maybe, maybe not. But essentially, any time there's a change that's made, we go through our own validation process to ensure it's correct, and then we make the appropriate changes based on um, based on what based on what uh, what they're looking for. And. Uh, so to add to that, we ha we also have uh, a tab up here that says Add Researcher Organization. So in my opinion, this is probably one of the most important parts of the ASA map is adding more people, adding yourselves, adding people that you know of to the ASA map. And uh, you can see here it's broken down by the top three categories, company, researcher, institution. And if you just... So upon, uh, say, you want to enter a researcher, you put in all the data that you have about the researcher, and you can see there's several different types of info that would show up on your profile based on what you feel would be important to describe yourself about. And uh, these, aren't, these aren't added right away. They have to go through, again, our validation process. but. I don't think I've ever rejected anybody. Uh, I'm always happy to take more people on. Um, but yeah, definitely this is something that we want people to continue continuously use and um, it helps us help you. And last but not least, there's also a search function. Um, there's a basic name search or a keyword search and if you're looking for very specific things, there's also an advanced search where if you're looking for maybe a small company that focuses solely on Alzheimer's disease, then you could, you could do that as well. And I think that's I think we have, okay, we'll, we'll address the questions uh, in a sec, but I, that pretty much concludes uh, the, demo, the demo of the ASN map, and uh, I just thought it'd be a good idea to also bring up some discussion around it, and really the whole reason for this is not just for coffee, tea, and cookies and biscuits, but also, but we, we really appreciate your value and your, your perspective on the topic, and your opinions are really important to us and 
we want to move forward in this and in the right direction that you think would be of value. So I think we got some of this. There's also a few questions that yeah. just came up. I don't know yeah, if I want to address those. I think we'll address that. Sure. So I think this is um, where uh, you guys can give us ideas or, or give us some direction. I think we want to figure out how to mine the full value of this tool. And uh, this is sort of phase one. We've been calling it our beta version for a long time. We want to we want to build on it and enhance it. And we have a few ideas, but um, it's like anything. When you are too close to it, you start to lose perspective on how it might be useful. So it would be really valuable to us. And if you could, just to give us any of your thoughts, if you have any ideas on how we might improve upon it or, or tweak it a bit, um, whether this is of value in your perspective at all. Um, so these are some questions that we that we canned and so that we don't have to uh, limit ourselves to them. Um, but I think I'd just like to turn it over and open it up to, to anyone that might be interested in asking questions, recognizing there's people in the. Yeah, why don't you go to this? Do you think research profiles with their current uh, research projects? Not to that specificity but it's more of a broader view of what the research is. Uh, there's actually, actually, just recently we added in a new comment section so so that they're not so limited to, you know, just picking out a bunch of boxes. They could actually type in some detail about maybe a specific project that they want to bring to light. So there is flexibility in that. Maybe for the sake of sometimes frustrating being someone on the, on the phone line, so let's start with some questions. So um, how long did it take to develop and how much did it cost? Um, <laughs> so, so we can address that. It, I think to get it to this stage, it took between, I mean, it started even with Mars research, with Mars um, market research. Probably all together, I would say two years. Yeah. Um, and its cost, if you take in person costs and things, I think it's hard to say because they are different people working yeah. as well as the external consultants. It, was, it wasn't very expensive. No, the the group that did this for us, the cost was reasonable, but we spent a lot of a lot of people in house spent a lot of time on it, and it took a lot of close sort of micromanagement of the project. Uh, so it took a lot more time, my time and Stephanie's time certainly, and now Lucas's time and the the person that was focused on it, Rochelle's time, way more than we thought it was going to take. I think. Um, these things, if you kind of leave them and don't manage them closely, they could become uh, not so useful and badly managed. So it was, it took a lot more time than we thought internally. Can you ballpark it? Like, do you know, was it no, it's than, like, what orders of magnitude are we talking about? You mean time or cost? Uh -huh. Cost, I mean, the, the group charged us around just under $40,000 to, to create this. Um, Sorry, go ahead. It's very reasonable. I'd say the whole thing probably was everybody's time and everything would be under two hundred thousand. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. That's right. And the ongoing costs are, are fairly reasonable. Since yeah. It's reasonable and then you do have to have a staff person though who keeps you know, like Lucas devotes himself. Lucas has many other things, but you have to have a dedicated mind that really do. You have to have somebody to respond to the contribution. So the next question, do you have to get consent from researchers, uh, institutions, and patient advocacy groups as well as private, uh, private um, to use the asset map? So we sent everybody that was on the asset map an email and said, this is what it looks like. We've included you. If you'd like, we can take you off. And how many people said, yes, please take me off? I think about four. Four. But I think they were, because they were retired. So they yeah, they were retired. Right. So we we did ask them permission if we could keep them on. And I think the process was if you don't answer within X number of days or weeks, then we'll just assume that you've said that you're consenting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is there a way to disseminate information to all these folks easily? That's a good question. Can we just you know blast the asset map? You could. But we also don't want to oversaturate information to people. We don't want to be sending weekly emails to people to the point where they're just going to just brush it off. So I think if at a more at a more reasonable frequency of uh, emails would be okay. 
And as Shiva mentioned, we do send validation emails to the people that are on the SMS and on a biannual basis. Could you give people the option to sign up for something like that on the map so that if you have other newsletters and things that go out from here, so that they could have an option to uh, to sign up for the we could, um, So we have a subscribe function on our website. Yeah. We could add a link to that from in the asset map where they could subscribe mm -hmm. and take them to our website or take mm -hmm. them to our mm -hmm. subscription. It's mm -hmm. a good idea. We have seen that do it. The next step, uh, I mean, you're making the connection to drive forward on it to be the funding. That's where we all kind of come back to. So is there a possibility of even bringing in different funding options and having that as part of a, another uh, section of the asset map? And then notifying the relevant individuals or having the ability to sign up to be notified by relevant individuals. It's a good idea. Well, funding opportunity? Yeah. I have a question for you about evaluation. Um, you mentioned during the presentation that um, I think the, the key question you're facing is how do you how do you measure your impact as a catalyst? And so I think it's really easy to see how a tool like this could be helpful in being a catalyst. And you mentioned doing some analytics, which would you know help measure use. Are people actually going to the tool and using it? But what are your thoughts um, about other kinds of measurement around impact I mean, in terms of whether it's having the intended effect. You have some anecdotal sort of qualitative information, but how, how did you think about like five years from now knowing whether you've actually strengthened connections or had some impact on the cluster as a cluster? Mm -hmm. sure. um, so we actually have an RFP out right now for some of the visualized collaboration using the asset map data. So the idea is, if you get, if we, we have all the names, just a matter of visualizing the constellation, showing who's already working together, and then there's a number of ways we can do this. It'd be interesting to get feedback on this too. One of them is the events we hold and the programs that we run that we fund, visualizing how that's changed, so we can we do that pre-OBI, pre-OBI, and then now, and you can do it over time, so you can see the strength and the new network's changing. Um, but what we don't know is what we don't know. So we, you know, we went to a workshop a couple of weeks ago in, in Hamilton for Rett syndrome, and there was two of our researchers from different research programs who were both there, um, who had had a, a talk at a, one of the events that we held and realized they both had interested in this, and then they were there um, working in, with, this, with the Rett syndrome group. And had we not been there, we would have never known. And I'm feeling you know, there's a lot of that happening because researchers, by definition, are curious, I think. And when they find somebody who's doing something similar to them, they often will, will take that opportunity to, to have a discussion maybe a little more. And it's, if they're physically in a room, then we maybe know that, but otherwise we don't. And then what are the weightings? So if you and I are at the same workshop, but we don't talk, but we're in the same room, does that, does that deserve any weighting? Is it a one? Whereas if we write a grant together or we do a research study together, what does that weighting look like? And, and how do you determine the strengths of networks? And so we you know, don't know. We're asking experts about that. But um, the idea is the grand vision is to be able to show over time how the networks change. Yeah. And also, there's other um, more concrete examples. Like some of our entrepreneurs, like you saw in the video, there was um, Dr. Ali Morby. He was one of the entrepreneurs we funded in the first round. Now his technology was brought into one of our research programs, our cerebral palsy research programs. So that's a real connection that we have made. And that's that product development. That's, you know, it's not just the connection, it's product development. Um, there's innovation, there's intellectual property, there's a lot of outcomes from that connection. How do we measure that one? So we're trying to uh, capture that through this RFP, um, sort of showing the connections and the growth of these connections. The asset map by itself is um, not an active, uh, it's, it's a fairly passive tool. It, it's an information center, so I'm not sure you want to focus your evaluation so much on the tool but more on the other kinds of collaborations and then the process of looking at those other collaborations, you find out whether the tool is one of the useful yeah. elements for them. There is a whole technique out there now being developed called network analysis that they're using in knowledge transfer. So that whole area, Melanie Barwick at the kids is starting to look at it in knowledge transfer. So you might look at that methodology as well, see whether it could be useful for you. And it's funny because when we had our evaluation workshop, um, at the end of the day, Martin Buxton 
um, who is uh, a guru and sort of quantitative analysis, said to us, the most important thing you can do is tell your stories. Because you have all your stakeholders in the room already saying that this is bringing them value and that it's furthering their, uh, what is they're trying to achieve. So one of the ideas is if we could draw the constellation and if every person is a dot, every company is a dot, and we can show the connectivity between them and how it's changing over time, you may be able to have a feature where you could click on, you know, where there's a really dense concentration and a story pops up that talks about what's actually happening there. So they kind of add storytelling to the, the quantitative um, depiction of how, how um, networks are changing over time. There's a few other questions up there as well that we haven't addressed. Who's responsible for updating the information? How often? Do like to be addressed that one? We're right here right now. Okay. Are the plans to take this to national? The other provinces are willing to pay. <laughs> I think right now, probably. Not. I mean, it took a lot of uh, time and management to get it to where it is now. Were you surprised by the clusters? I mean, look, they look like the academic health science centers uh, across the country, except there's you know, there's a little bit in North Bay and there's something in Windsor. And so Thunder we, Bay. So, yeah, Thunder Bay, yeah. not North Bay. I meant Thunder Bay. And uh, Windsor, were you surprised at all by the by what you gathered and what it looked like on the map? I think not just through the map, although. We were quite surprised when we saw that, but through our other initiatives we and our interactions with other regions outside of Toronto, such as Windsor, we're always surprised when we find something new and something that's out there that we never really knew about, and it always just opens up this new gateway to a whole new sort of uh, expertise in neuroscience that we never knew about. And of course, it's those partnerships that led to them being on the map in the first place. But you know, where as we go out on these these tours around the province, that's that's basically how we learn more about what's out there. Have you thought about um, uh, I don't know whether the software can do this, uh, layering on top things like the stroke centers in the in the province, because there are designated stroke centers now, you know, Sunnybrook, Toronto Western, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. Uh, that's another way of Sort of showing it, but uh, again, it's sort of a passive tool, so yeah. you have to decide how much information you want to yeah. uh, layer. Our, our approach, uh, just to dive a bit deeper on the, on um, an analysis question, is uh, our philosophy is always get our house uh, sort of in order in Ontario first. Make sure that what we're doing here is great before we try and spread anywhere else. Otherwise, there's a risk of diffusion of energy, right? And and um, so we're really trying to build this up here. Um, the second one is a principle around taking advantage of what already exists. And it's something that we've already that we've always done, and we encourage other people to do. So this is a resource we've already invested time and money into, and the extent to which people want or are interested in, in expanding it across the country. We're never close to those conversations, um, and we hope that if somebody wants to do something like this, that we can work together on it. And your partners are you, when you talked about a network and forming your partnerships. If your partner, if you have a, uh, a great partnership network in Ontario, but you have a lot of partners right across the country, will that become a problem to, to try to do this or not? Um, I'm not. So you're only mapping part of what the relationship is. You're right. So saying. right, right. If I'm not looking at the whole partnership, so if right. we were to try to form a network, you know, for SNAP across the country, which is what we're doing because we're for the Pico Center, which BC did a geo mapping project for us mm -hmm. that looked at that mapped every police station, every school, everything across the country based on density mm -hmm. and need. Um, but our partners are national, right across the country. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I mean, we haven't something we have to think about. Okay. Well, I, I just on that point. I mean, I think where you started is you spoke about the asset map. When you think about clusters, you actually spoke about geographical proximity. Mm -hmm as a really important factor. You know, what, yeah. what you're looking at is you know, what happens when you find out that someone down the street from you is doing the same thing. So that's where the strength of, of building connections. Mm -hmm. I agree that, I mean, I had the same question too. You might work internationally with mm -hmm. people. Yeah. Yeah. You're for, them working. So what you're saying is you're forming these hubs, community practice, right? Yeah. The so then you yeah. can share, the right? The face-to-face -face stuff happens. that happens, happens because we all live in Toronto or close by. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And so yeah. you're sort of looking at that 
element of, of networking and building relationships, particularly with this. Mm -hmm. Although, obviously, they'll see potential. Just because of technology, yeah. you, know, exactly. you know, you could be across the country, but you could be in the same room, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I imagine that you're aware of the um, analytics, the commercial um, analytics capabilities that Thomson Reuters and and um, uh, Elsevier uh -huh. offer, and I mean that's that's one way to get at those connections because then they can track um, publication, who's public, who's um, uh, uh, who's who's um, uh, what research projects are being doing uh, are being done, what the partners in the research are, um, the publications, the the uh, the citations, and all that, and so you can you can build kind of a uh, uh, a graphical representation of people's influence um, provincially, nationally, or internationally, mm -hmm. and 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 that might be something to, to sort of look at. I mean, you'd, you'd probably use it for a slightly different purpose than this, but it'd be a, it'd be a great adjunct to what you've done. Yeah, there's a company. It's a company called Atlas that we looked at. Innovation Atlas. So they they track what's going on across Canada with respect to publications and research grants. Um, so they they have that kind of information, and it really goes across the country. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are there are some of those resources out there. That's a nice complement to to what we have here. So just to kill two birds with one stone, uh, Tara and Rebecca have similar questions around. Um, is it a development an ongoing process, and how often do we update it? And I think every six months is. Mm -hmm. We, uh, we review all the content. Yeah, and again, it's really important to have someone dedicated to it. So Lucas is really working on this. If you leave it, then it becomes stale. There's also another question around what our search strategies were for finding researchers, organizations, and institutions. So how did we find them to begin with? Right. So here, we the first cut was done by uh, Moore's market research group. So they have uh, they sort of go across and um, they have lists and lists of organizations um, across the province and what they're doing. But we also went to groups like HCX. We went to the ministries and we asked them for their list. Um, and in, in addition to that, we also did our own research and did Google. Uh, but um, all the ministries, um, MEDT, MRI, which were all of them about their list, and other organizations that we thought may have lists, um, and if they wanted to share their lists with us. We also made sure all the researchers that were involved in our research projects were there, all the companies that you know we've been in contact with, or the patient advocacy group. So everyone who was kind of we had been in touch with, we certainly dealt with the foundation for it, and then we went broader and broader. So the 800 researchers that are on the map, we've uh, about 200 of them are involved in our research programs mm -hmm. in the five core programs, and we have two other programs we didn't talk about that were sort of um, helping them along a little bit. They're not getting a lot of funding from us, but just to keep meeting and evolving their ideas, and that's an addiction and traumatic brain injury and concussion. So they're not counted in the 200. That's what I was going to ask, because you had talked about the idea of having sort of a constellation approach, and so presumably if you do that, you would see clear hubs of who are the most collaborative institutes or perhaps based on connections. So had you guys ever considered incorporating that into the profiles of the list to sort of emphasize who are the people that are the most well connected or the most active with the OBI or anything to sort of differentiate who might be more approachable, I suppose, in terms of possible contacts? That's a good idea. Um, we've tried to capture some some of that. Um, so in the asset map in the back end, there is information on each one of the entries on which one of our programs are they involved in. Mm -hmm. Are they involved in FedDev? Are they involved in our ID programs? Are they an OBI entrepreneur? Are they an intern? Or, or mm -hmm. you know, so there we do have that information in the back end. We haven't. Uh, it, you can't access it visually mm -hmm. in the front end, but we can certainly use it that way. And maybe we need to build on that. a little bit about the RFPs that you have out connected to these asset maps? Sure. Um, so essentially, <coughs> the challenge that we put out was for somebody to use the data that's on the back end of the asset map, which essentially is a large spreadsheet, um, 
to basically create a visualization tool that's dynamic uh, over time that allows us to assess how collaboration is changing over time. And we didn't make it any more specific than that because we didn't want to make it too narrow and that there's a lot of groups out there. So there's the proteomics folks who are mapping uh, you know, the proteome and interactions between proteins and stuff and they've got a lot of really neat visualization stuff. Um, we wanted to leave room for people to bring new ideas to us. So I think it just closed. Actually, I think we're reviewing it probably today or tomorrow, um, the application. So we don't really know what it's, what it's going to look like yet. But we have some general concepts in our mind. We just don't know how practical they are yet. If you have any ideas, we'd love to hear them. <laughs> are you, do you work with groups that do that? Or are you interested in that? Or? I'd like to learn more about it. I mean, as we're evolving, they're evolving as well, and they've actually started looking into this whole network mapping bit as well. Um, so they're still in really early stage in terms of that. But in this RFP, we're hoping to find a specific company or vendor that primarily focuses on network mapping, and then we could somehow link that with our asset map together rather than have yeah. um, do it. So one of the criteria was they needed to be willing to work with a third party to, to develop the software together. When you were, oh, sorry, go ahead. There's, um, there's one area that, and I'm trying to remember back the circular map and uh, the inner circle of it, um, because it seems like there's a lot of different topics that are, I guess, addressed in the outer circle when you could choose. but. I'm wondering if you're missing, or if you took um, measures to address um, clusters that have high meaning that are very easy to kind of, you know, pick and choose and just kind of jump into. And if you have, then how did you come about uh, choosing which are the most meaningful clusters? You know, within a specific disorder or something, or yeah, or something that would be easy for maybe the general public or easy for um, someone who does work in one area but is an expert in another area to, to kind of choose, oh yeah, this is what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. you know, so someone might be um, looking at um, different cognitive processes that happen and isn't really that interested in neurodegenerative disease or, or dysfunctions and things like that. So. Yeah. We had a lot of discussions around how to classify this, um, and it's an ongoing thing. We don't think we have it perfect. Yeah. For example, on the industry side, Lucas and others are reclassifying some of the companies and the categories right now. Um, so if you have ideas on how we should classify certain areas, we would love to hear it. Um, Do you work with uh, your stakeholder groups to help you with that classification? Like we just said, this was in beta. Mm -hmm. Format. Did you bring in some of the researchers, the companies, et cetera, et cetera, to say this is how we're organizing it? Does this work for you? We, I mean, we didn't ask them about classification directly, but we told them how, where they would fit in into the um, asset map, and if they had a problem with that, they could let us know. Uh, we had internal discussions mostly about how to classify, and it was always it, there was a lot of changes initially when we realized, you know, what there's better ways of doing this. Um, there's another whole area would come up, for example, that we had not considered. So it, it, at, at some stage, though, it becomes a um, sort of decision you just have to make. And somebody may do it differently. Um, but if there was an obvious lack of something, then we are certainly willing to change things. But as, you know, as there were differences around even our own table around how, how this should be organized. Well, I think there's some mixed methods, ways that you could do to get um, that information and um, get it in, I guess, a quantitatively sound manner at the end using uh, multi-dimensional scaling and higher cluster analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good idea. We haven't um, mm -hmm. been nice to ask you. I mean, this needs to make sense to the people that are using it, right? So they need to be able to uh, find how they would yeah. the nomenclature is. Mm -hmm. I really liked my initial ideas around um, um, asking people for stories, giving that opportunity in the same note, they can give feedback on how they might, you know, even add a button saying, have some feedback on how to improve the map, let us know, and, and get, get feedback that way from folks too. Mm -hmm.
So who's actually um, using this? Is it because as a like a researcher or a neuroscientist, it sounds like an amazing tool to know what, what's going on. But are there is it anyone from like the general public, like not necessarily the advocacy groups, but the people like the patients themselves that are going to be using this, or even just let's not even say patients, but just general public who is interested in neuroscience. Is that are those users? Like I'm really interested in the the student aspect of that. I think that's really interesting that they're gravitating towards this. Are there any just like general people interested in brain stuff using this? Well, again, our, our Google Analytics can only be as specific as, as it can be. Um, the only reason I found out about the students was because they, they told me directly. You know? mm. <laughs> no one who wasn't actually not interested in neuroscience, someone who's just kind of just surfing the internet and never really told me that they'd be interested in this kind of thing. But I can definitely see that you know, for anyone who does have any remote interest in neuroscience and knowing what's out there, I I wouldn't see why not they would I wouldn't see a reason why they wouldn't use this website. I think if you had a condition to a neurological condition you could use it in search. Yeah, but okay. So the work that I do is very much about um, like just the average person not with a neurological condition, but just curious about brain. And I don't see them, I don't see this accessible to those people um, because it's very, like I said, it sounds very much like someone who has a vested interest in a condition, um, but not more just like general brain health, like improving brain health type people. That's just my sense though, but um, I was just wondering if that was a target group. It's a good point. I mean, there's, so this is, um, so the, the question is how do we actually continue to evolve this as a resource and right now we have some resource sections on our website where people that are just generally interested in brain can go and learn about it. Um, this started with a very specific focus but I can see us evolving outwards. So one of the things that was another good idea that was raised is where are all the stroke treatment centers in the province. The same thing, so my background in research is in epilepsy. There's nowhere to go find out where you can get treated for epilepsy or where the epilepsy surgical centers are. They exist in the province. There's no, no central place to go find out where they are. You're kind of left, left to your own and hope that your doctor knows about them so they can tell you about them. Um, so there's lots of different ways, I think, to, to engage the public in, in empowering them in, in, in a role. But again, that would be more uh, sort of disorder specific as opposed to general public. We do a lot of stuff for general public. So during Brain Awareness Week, we really tried to get this idea of I Heart Brain. And uh, normally, we'd have a bunch of t-shirts we'd give you that say I Heart Brain on it. We'll have them next time. Um, but just trying to get this message out around brain disorders and how important they are. And our CEO, Don, always says, this isn't brain. This is brain. What's happening? Like you're, everything in your environment, how you're attending to people around you and how you're interpreting what is they're saying. And, the fact that someone can say something and that something will actually change your brain yeah. um, is phenomenal and we're trying to get that message out there that, um, and that's a general public thing. Everyone needs to know that and everything kind of stems from that, from general awareness. Um, now that, uh, have you told everybody who's on it that it's up and available for them to use it? Have you been able to, that they all know, the 800 or 1,000 yeah. people who are on it know that it's there? Yeah, okay. in fall, last year in fall, we, uh, we officially launched it people to use, but... Might send them reminders. I think that would be a mm -hmm. sure. Send them a reminder. Send some social media and, and our website, but we, we get the sense that it's not, you know, out there, out there. It's not in the back of everyone's mind where they think, gee, I'd really like to find Researcher X and, oh, there's the asset map. Or you, what you might do is uh, collect a couple of stories about the asset map and then share those with people on, this is how it's being used. Have you thought about using it this way? Yeah, that's a great idea. Stories it's out. a little bit of a marketing approach to it. Uh, and you must have ideas about how you hoped it would be used. And that's where your evaluation should focus to. Okay. So as a, an intended consequence, because the students were using it and uh, the job finding tool. Mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting because I mean our community practice or KTE has also I think ninety percent of the posts we see are, are job sharing posts. Um, so it's a way to move brain power around the province. Have you thought about exploring the of HR capacity? Having people post jobs through, you mean, or? I'm not sure. We're thinking about that audience because it was an audience who weren't really, you know, used to, weren't really thinking when you started. But, uh, 
you may find that the researchers, if they're looking for research assistance or something like that, that it, they've got a new research grant, that it, if you have a section, well, maybe on the website, but you can link it through the asset map to allow them to post. I think it's, thinking, it's really been useful for thinking down to that level of individual use cases. You know, what is it, an actual user looking for when they go there? What's the process that they would follow to make a connection? And then you know, how would you map that? And focus in the communication efforts on those groups and those uses and getting the word out that here's exactly how you can use it. Because otherwise, as a tool, it's like, well, it's passive in a sense, but you can make any uses of it, but I want you to explore those and really promote specific uses. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, we would, I think the social component of it is really interesting. For example, you know, using LinkedIn profiles for people, and that would sort of speak to the start to, to look at the HR side of things. Um, we can do that. Um, the group in that that we're working with, they are, you know, they, they have limited capacity. They're not sort of, you know, it's not, uh, it's not really one of the more expensive projects we've done. So we would have to look at budgeting and things like that to expand this and maybe work with different partners to do this. We're not sure if Synap has all the capabilities. We need to layer on these things, but it's a really good idea for sure. Well, just on that note, I'm curious up from the technology point of view, um, what your experiences were pros and cons with the tool and some of the limitations were things you might have done differently. I think it's a good idea and other people might be thinking about this as a as a way to map other mm -hmm. kinds of assets. Mm -hmm. Um, so to a large extent, the tool was created. They, they have asset maps for, for example, it was done with a few other um, organizations for different disorders or different um, areas completely. Um, so there, are, there is functionality built in that is modular, so it could be used for any kind of asset mapping. Um, however, we, we did have to work very closely with them to make it what we wanted it to be. Um, so it's not a plug-and-play solution at all. Um, it's a solution where you really have to build the back end very neatly, very cleanly, exactly what you want, classified exactly how you want, and give the, the information in a really clear, concise way to the company for them to be able to through their modular sort of system. Um, so. One of the other things you might, if you're thinking about evaluation, is that uh, it's been my experience that researchers within a specific area often know each other quite well. They're at the same conferences, they, et cetera. But what you'd like to know about this is are researchers uh, connecting now across boundaries to researchers in a close area? Uh, so this the network analysis gets into the boundary stuff. Uh, I think you'll have to go back and ask them about it at some point, but that's the kind of thing that you would really want to know about whether the asset map helped people to cross boundaries into other areas where researchers are looking at similar but but not exactly the same things, so that they create new partnerships. Yep, exactly. I'm just noticing a few more questions online. Mm -hmm. um, what's your dissemination approach provincially and locally? I think we've talked a little bit about that. Basically, we've just I mean, we sent an email to everyone that's on the asset map. We've been using social media and the website. I'm not sure if it's still on our website main page, but it was on our website main page for a while. No. Um, it's not. No, I will. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we will, and things like this, of course, too. We're just, I mean, it's been built for a while and it's kind of been out for a while, but we're just now getting mm -hmm. to the point where we really want to start talking about it and trying to get some feedback on it. <coughs> so, mm -hmm. any thoughts on how we might more effectively disseminate? I think we've heard some already. Mm -hmm. I think even going to conferences, exhibiting that might be, um, we, I found that really useful for our network. Yeah. Well. Yeah, we've done that. Not as much as we should, but definitely should um, try and engage that more. But that's also where that's also where I run into those scientists that aren't up. <laughs> that should be so I got a yeah. invite list to that yeah. before I go. That's, but that's great because you're expanding yeah. uh, on it and you're adding to the uh, usefulness. I'm not sure if that excuse will hold well with them, but. Okay. 
<laughs> Thanks, Annalise, for offering to, uh, to disseminate the map. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. We can get it back in our, in our main page. Yeah. It's been swallowed by other events that are happening. Yeah, that's great. I'm, sure. at, uh, I'm at Western University, and um, our, like one of my areas of responsibility is in uh, knowledge mobilization and um, throwing events. So um, we just threw uh, an education neuroscience symposium, and uh, we live streamed it as well. And it would have been great to have a tool like this where, you know, our marketing team could have just gone in and clicked all of the relevant researchers in Ontario that had interest in education and neuroscience and development, all those areas, mm -hmm. and then to, you know, send them a message saying, we're going to be streaming, this is the time, tune in, yep. send feedback, send a question on Twitter or whatever. Yep. So, so that's um, maybe um, letting people who, universities, I guess. Mm -hmm. right. They should be listed. The faculty of neuroscience science should be listed, aren't yeah. they? Mm -hmm. I, I just mean letting them know that this yeah, exists that's so, that, mm -hmm. so that people, when, when they're throwing symposiums and events, even like uh, weekly talks, a lot, of the, a lot of the faculty now are wired to transmit video, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. knowledge mobilization. Like the main function of the asset map is to map individuals and organizations. Is there an interest to map um, projects, current and past projects? So, like a knowledge base. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> that would be a lot of work. That's a lot of validation work and um, sort of making sure that we're current with the projects. And that is information that's available on the Innovation Atlas. Um, so that company does uh, you know, tell you what each researcher is doing um, on a project level, on a grant level. Uh, we haven't, I think we did talk about it. We can talk about, you know, do we want to list the project? Working on, what we've done is we've created, there's a link to their website in each profile. So you can go to their website and then look at what they're working on. But we decided we weren't going to list their project on our site directly. I jokingly refer to this as the lava life of neuroscience. We can go and uh, find your partner, potential, uh, potential partner. We don't want to get into that functionality. But if you've got a story about that, you can include it. A, uh, <laughs> that's a hand mail neuroscientist. We're chili peppers. <laughs> Is there anything else that people have for uh, advice, suggestions, thoughts? Maybe just like, you know, in Amazon, people who search this also looked at... Mm -hmm. That's interesting, yeah. Because yeah. if you don't really know what you're looking for and you're just starting out, you can help them sort of throw that. Uh, all That's that. a great idea. Mm -hmm. Great stuff, though. This is a little possibility. Yeah, I think um, having worked on a number of technology projects, the challenge is always looking at implementations of understanding what they need to do. A lot of great ideas that they could do. 